in Studio B to bring the heat before you really bring the heat tonight? You know, you'll be the answer to a trivia question. Really? Who was the first guest on Behind the Mic? Yeah, with Greg Rubin? let's so, go, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> tonight, sure right out of the right out of the shoots at six. 8 o'clock Eastern. It's Spencer Linton tonight. So uh, Spencer followed by BYU AD Tom Holmo and former BYU tight end current administrator Chad Lewis. That's tonight's lineup. You're going to end up on one of Greg's Cougar quizzes. That that question, who was the first guest on Behind the Mic, that's going to be on the Cougar quiz. Well, it just when, might be. That's when you make it. <laughs> it's a BYU personality, right? Did you show up on the Cougar quiz? That'll be fun tonight. Looking forward to it. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Get us going. And uh, I, I think people will enjoy it. Uh, Wednesdays, 6 to 7, Mountain, 8 to 9 Eastern. Uh, an hour of Cougar Sports Conversation. Again, the format will generally be uh, somebody from BYU TV Sports to join me out of the blocks, and then a couple of feature-length interviews with somebody kind of current and somebody from back in the day. We call it Catching Up with the Cougars for, our, for that uh, third interview segment, and we'll do it uh, every Wednesday for an hour, and uh, hope people tune in. Yeah, I love it because it, it fills a niche that really isn't filled right now. Like I, People love nostalgia and remembering – these former Cougars, where they are, what they're doing, and, and the things that they're accomplishing. So I, you know, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. We'll, we'll kick around the current stuff, and we'll go back in the day. It'll be fun. Yeah, love it. Okay, now to the current stuff with BYU football into – it's called fall camp, but it's not technically fall. So I just call it training camp. Yeah, I'm kind of with you. Yeah. With the whole NFL thing, the seasons, like well, you can call it training yeah. camp. Okay, BYU football NFL guys camp. are doing it. We're doing it. Let's call it training camp. Okay. Yeah. Who is the BYU football training camp MVP in 2017 thus far? I hope you don't consider it to be a cop-out, but I'm going to say that depth is the MVP Ooh. so far. I think BYU's deep at a lot of really important spots, and I think through the, through the first week of camp, uh, I've seen a lot of guys be able to play a lot of spots, and, and to me that's, that's maybe the early indicator of where this team might end up, whether it's running back or tight end or wide receiver. I think there's eight solid right now to play 10 on the offensive line. Linebackers Fred and Butch and, and Francis get all the pub, but they haven't needed to play a ton of reps, and the guys behind them play really well. Uh, and in the secondary, we've heard this, uh, you know, the defensive coaches talk about where they feel they're lined up right now at safety in one and two and three and maybe even four deep sometimes. And so to me, just how many guys can play and are able to play right now and give the coaches a level of comfort. I haven't even touched the D-line. So many D-line, D linemen, I think, can play already. And I, I mean, right now, I, I'll bet you Coach Tuiaki thinks he's got 10 that he could, that, that, that wow. he could play right now. A solid two deep and then a, another tackle and another end. A solid 10, and there are more than that on the field right now. Um, so, so to me, that's maybe the early MVP is just how – uh, how well equipped they appear to be one and two deep and beyond at, at, at a number of spots on the field. All right, you went with depth, and depth was one of the factors I used to answer our Twitter question today, which is which side of the football will perform best in 2017? I said defense, and I used depth as one of my factors. How would you answer that question? Which side of the football do you expect? Well, you know, absolute uh, you know, projections aren't necessarily my strength or in my wheelhouse. I'm more of a narrator than a predictor, I think, when it comes right down to it. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm going to say – uh, this team will be good if all three facets contribute to wins uh, over the course of the season, as was the case last year. But, you know, let's remember, BYU outpoints Toledo 55-53. That's a game where Elisha Tuiaki says, offense, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> then after that game, BYU didn't allow any more than 28 the rest of the way and allowed 21 or fewer in seven of the last eight. So the defense really picked up steam toward the end of the year. But in the first month, too, BYU was losing and or winning games in the teens. I mean, I mean the defense was, was solid, I thought, kind of start to finish last year with a first-year coordinator, but yet the offense had to win games here and there. And let's not forget, kickers had two game winners last year. Two of the, two of the nine wins came on last plays of the game or last kicks of the game, uh, Old Roy against Arizona and an Almond, I think, against Toledo, right? 55-53. So every side, of you know, all, all three sides of the ball can say, we don't get to nine without – you know, us maybe having the big moment or the key moment. So instead of saying offense or defense, I want to make sure that special teams gets acknowledgement and realizing that uh, there, there will be games in which we say, you know, that was the more dominant side or phase, and BYU wouldn't have won the game without that group. But uh, as much as the defense is stocked and loaded and expected to be kind of the anchor of this team, We've already seen uh, that, that, you know, Tanner Mangum and the tight ends and the wideouts and the backs and the solid old line coming together show that they're not to be forgotten. And, uh, and you know, what, regardless of, of tossing about numbers as to what's going to be a successful season for the offense or not, uh, I, I, I don't think that there will be a, a, a time this season where we just go, man, the, the offense isn't there. They're going to be there. 
Uh, and they had to be there at times last year, and they really were. I know that people, and I saw this on Twitter, w- when you brought up that 4,000-yard passing season for Tanner Mangan, people were like, whoa, 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 slow, slow down. But the more I thought about that, 14 games, this is going to be a bowl team. Like, BYU is going to go to a bowl game. I, it's going to happen. Okay, so they will play 14 games. That's 285 yards passing a game. Is it really that far-fetched to think that Tanner Mangum could pull something off like that? Well, year? my recollection was last week, it was kind of like, what what would be a sign that the offense is kind of really humming or really yeah. – and I threw that number out as if, yeah, if the offense is really clicking – especially trying to make up so many lost rushing yards with some passing yards, that would be a number. I'm not going to be disappointed, nor nor should anyone hold that number over anyone's head. It was just a number to say, yeah, if this thing is really humming and really cooking, that's probably where they could get to. And, and, you know, you you look at, you know, Phil Steele's projections. He has BYU uh, passing for 4,000 and change just based on his, whatever his number, whatever system kicks out his numbers. Well, how about that? He says they're going to be in that range with 14 games. I think they, I think he has them averaging 301 yards a game passing, something like that. So, but regardless of that, it's just a number. And it would just be an indicator that this thing is really cooking with gas. I'm not going to hold it out over anyone's head or say they have to hit this or it's a bummer if they don't because yards, whether passing or rushing, are secondary to points and wins. And it's just how you get the wins. And I don't really care how it comes. I just know that when you lose the number one and number five all-time rushing leaders in BYU history, those numbers may not be on this year's roster right now. Uh, And so we expect there to be a more productive passing attack. And with a guy like Tanner Mangum throwing it, why would you not expect that kind of thing? Far too much logic happening. Well, I I, I just expect there to be a (laughs) – whether or not it's it's Ty's uh, intent – there will probably be a bit of a shift in balance in terms of total production just based on who you've got doing the things uh, he's going to be calling. Uh, But, again, numbers secondary to wins, and that's all that really matters right now. Yeah. What's been uh, the most surprising thing that you've witnessed through five days of training camp? Maybe uh, J.J. Nwigwe catching a pass. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't expect him to be wearing number 96 in camp. But there he was trotting out in the second or third day, switching a 65 for a 96. That was kind of interesting to see. Yeah, I was like, who's, who's 96? We all who's 96? Like, yeah, uh, and, and whether it's surprising or impressive, uh, Red Almond's leg just looks like it has more thump to it right now. It sounds different coming off the foot. I think he's got more length. And, and for a BYU team that really hasn't had a tactical kicking weapon from you know longer range in quite a long time, I think that's a positive sign that he was really booming some kicks in the early days of camp. And I think he's really embraced the starting kicker role. And it just looks like he's better and stronger and the, and, and the ball is traveling farther off his foot. Uh, time will tell in games. But uh, it'd be nice to, to have that sense that once you get inside the 40, we're thinking about points one way or the other. Um, it, it, it's just been so long. I think it's been 11 years since BYU's had a 50-yard field goal in a game. And, and not that Rhett will be that guy this year, or there will be a lot of those kinds of field goals, but that's, that's kind of what's been missing from BYU special teams for the decade or so is, is that real long-range weapon. Maybe it's here this year. Maybe it doesn't come till next year or beyond. But I, I think Rhett looks longer and sounds longer so far this year. That sounds like a Cougar quiz question. Who was the last BYU kicker to boot a 50-plus yard field And it was Jared McLaughlin against Air Force in 2006. Oh, so if, say if the, he does ask that question, make sure you come back and yeah, give the answer. Yeah, your fault if you, you don't, uh, don't know, get that one right. You don't know and the by answer. the way, if you were to say, you know, if you were to get people like, you know, five or six kickers to pick from, Jared McLaughlin doesn't immediately become the guy that you think about, but that was him uh, a long, long time ago. Yeah, it yeah. has been a really and I wonder, long I've often wondered, if you, go to, if you were to go back 10 years, how many FBS teams don't have at least one 50-yard field goal in that time? Not sure what the number, but BYU is one of those teams. Man, it's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while. Will it be Red Allman? And he's coming off a pretty solid season when you look at the numbers. And not that it has to be him or this year. Just, you know, something, if, if, you're, if you just feel comfortable in the 40s of getting points, that, that's a big difference. I think last year, maybe his long might have been 37, if memory serves. Um, but, yeah, it's just a weapon. Yeah, and I believe Jake Oldred kicked a 42-yarder against Utah. Right. Before he, in fact, it might have been his last – was it his last game? Before I think it might have been one of his yeah, last games before he kind of got shelled for the season. But, again, kickers won games last year for BYU, too, so let's not forget those guys. Kickers yeah. are people, too. Johnny Linehan is smiling. Johnny Linehan is right happy now. right now. Yes. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about football for obvious reasons, but I know that you've, you've hung around some BYU basketball practices because – that starts up in November. We're not that far away from basketball either. If you had to pick a top story for BYU basketball right now or a headline, what would it be? I think style of play and versatility 
uh, and I, I, I've hit, hammered the theme of depth already today, but I, I would say I, I, I think there's more quality depth on this year's BYU roster. And uh, I, I think we're going to see a different looking team than the one that ended last season. Uh, very almost prototypical in terms of inside out last year. Uh, it'll, it'll look different, I think, from the way BYU ended uh, the 2016-17 campaign in a really positive way. We also should probably ask you about BYU women's soccer, but we're out of time. So we will do that. <laughs> but there, and, and, and that's day one of practice for them today. I was just, I was just out, out at Southfield a short time ago. They're going, they're rolling. They got two a days, and they'll be playing before you know it. So Yeah, blue yeah. and white game on Saturday for BYU women's yep. soccer. The voice of the Cougars on BYU Radio, Greg Rebell, with us in Studio B. Okay, tradition, roll the Canadian national anthem. It's time for A cool thing about Canada. And to pat you on the back, the TV voice of BYU women's soccer, Spencer Linton. Well, thank you. So we'll, we'll be teaming up a lot this year. We'll see each <laughs> other down down the press table a lot this season. So a uh, uh, cool thing about Canada, uh, the BYU wide receiving core historically has at the top one or two guys in most every category. Cody Hoffman, Austin Colley. Okay. Cody Hoffman's currently playing in the CFL. And Austin Colley was born in Canada when his dad was playing in the CFL. So the country of Canada has a connection to some of BYU's most prolific wide receivers. And then you throw in the fact that the guy currently tutoring BYU's wide receivers is a CFL Hall of Famer as one of the most prolific ever receivers in the Canadian game, Ben Cahoon. So wide receivers in Canada like this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't, don't deny it, people. Canada is a cool place. Ben Cahoon, I never would have made that connection. I, who knew Scott? CFL legend? CFL legend, really. I mean, oh. one of one of the best all timers in that country. Receptions, receiving yards, hundred yard seasons, Hall of Famer. Now, people think he, he was born in Canada because he, he was actually born in Ogden, while his Canadian parents were going uh, to BYU. And uh, ended up moving to Canada soon and spent a lot of his life in Canada. But uh, he was actually born in the States, went to Canada, came back. Of course, a great player at BYU, legend at the CFL. Wow. And Cody Hoffman was at practice the other day. Yes, he, he was. He was on a day off. In yes. fact, I, I was wondering why he was there because he's playing for Ottawa. But he was just chilling and uh, visited uh, campus and was at practice. And he's back, uh, back with the Red Blacks and uh, playing for the uh, CFL's Ottawa Red Blacks now. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. That is a thing about Canada. Oh my goodness. So much there. Greg, thanks for the time. Don't forget 8 Eastern, 6 Mountain Time tonight, the debut of Greg Rebel behind the mic. It's going to be a loaded show. Thanks, Greg. And I'll see you on the radio tonight. Yes, okay. I will be there.